Hey, Construction Champions, it's your host, Ron Newsbaum, and we're here for another episode of Construction Champions Podcast, where we're burning down the house. We've been bur- burning down the house for a year and a half. We're going to continue burning the damn house down twice a week, every Monday and every Thursday. And once again, I have another fantastic guest because we've already established you are not here for Ron Newsbaum. You're here for the fantastic guests I bring on, and you know what? I am perfectly fine with that. I would prefer that. So, Jason, it is great to have you here today. Let's go. I just got amped up with 10 volts of energy at the very least. (laughs) Hey, on Construction Champions, we bring the passion, we bring the excitement, because to me, that's what the construction industry deserves, and that is what we should bring. It's what I used to bring to job sites. So now I bring it to the podcast. It's a good culture. I appreciate it. Awesome, man. Well, why don't you take some time, tell the construction champions out there a little bit about you and what got you here to today? Sure. Um, So my name is Jason Paris. Uh, Most people know me. I founded a house painting company called Paris Painting. We operate out of the Twin Cities. Uh, We're an eight figure uh, business that mostly paints houses. And we'll walk every now and then into some kind of a commercial project, but that's more like we paint somebody's house and their uncle owns a building more than we are uh, niched into that. So it's a unique business um, nationally and it's scale for residential painting because of the lower average job size um, and that we were able to grow relatively fast. So that's, that's kind of what my mostly known for. Um, I volunteer a lot through the painting contractors association, which is a 140 year old organization. Uh, I was fortunate enough to serve on the board. I served as chair and I currently sit as the immediate past chair with them. Um, and then I have a whole little holdings group called all of holdings that I started with four of my buddies from college. And, uh, we've kind of started by scaling up Paris painting together, but then also making investments in other, uh, mostly house painting companies across the U S hmm. that's awesome, man. Yeah. And I'm super excited to have this conversation today and I'm just going to dive right in there and ask you the million dollar question. And that Mm. is what makes a construction champion? Okay. What makes a construction champion? Um, I think there's going to be character qualities more than uh, like certain tactical things. So one of my favorite sayings is that you never step into the same river twice. Uh, And what that means essentially is that our environment is always changing. The industry is always changing. Uh, the river you step in today, the world you step in today is going to change tomorrow. And you need to be prepared for that. So I think that the elements that make a construction champion, like you have to be good at a term that I like to call wayfinding. And wayfinding is when you don't have an exact map to get where you want to get to. Uh, but you know, maybe the qual- a qualitative element of the destination and you might know a general direction. So a classic example of this would be Lewis and Clark, Louisiana Purchase. Head west, find the ocean, map your way as you go, Hmm. right? So construction champion is someone that doesn't know exactly what needs to happen every single day, every single year, you know, five years from now, they don't know exactly what the economy is going to look like, uh, but they're really good at the art of wayfinding. Um, I think that's what makes a champion. I love that because we get on, we hear so much, like it's all about understanding where you're going. It's all about having it mapped out. You need the GPS. And what you just said is yeah. you, you got to be able to get there. You got to, I think, I think you need a compass more than a GPS. Cause I think it's, I it's that. a little um, unrealistic to have a GPS to scale, even a construction company. There's just too many variables. <laughs> uh, the economy is tough to predict. Also you deal with mostly people and people are just feral cats and they're hard to, hard to you know, shore up here. But I think you do need a compass and that is the hard work of creating, casting a vision, setting your values and knowing what direction you want to head in. But to say that you're going to have a GPS, um, I don't know if I would buy that. I don't think that's realistic in today's economy. I I would agree with that. And as I I think back on my experiences, it is more or less just having that compass. Like, you know... I mean, from being in the Marine Corps and doing land navigation to building a construction company, like, you know where you're headed. You're just trying to figure out how to get there and get to the waypoints to be able to get to the next waypoint. 
and you're just moving around and construction is a very fluent industry and there's always stuff changing. I mean, it can change weekly to monthly to quarterly and yearly. There's always changes that are happening. Yeah. Start of finding where you're going when you don't actually know where you're going. Right? <laughs> and yeah, that's an underrated, it's part of being an entrepreneur too. And so uh, not everybody you know, it's not a requirement to be an entrepreneur. Very few people are actually entrepreneurs. And this is a challenge that I think we have in the construction industry. My domain expertise comes from house painting, which has a very low barrier to entry. Um, so I don't know general contracting as much, but it's probably not too different where you have a lot of really skilled technicians that for one reason or another, end up owning on their own business. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes that's because there's no great options available, right? It's an unprofessionalized industry. It's not uh, very mature. And so they may have a talent as in sales or project management or even VP level operations, or even as a president. Uh, but there's really not any great companies for them to fulfill that potential with. So their, their default is they have to start their own business in order to realize their potential as a technician, uh, which is very different than being a true entrepreneur. Um, but yeah, entrepreneurs are kind of naturally wayfinders. Um, you don't have to be an entrepreneur, maybe to be a champion. So maybe I'll couch that. Um, but just, just realizing that being an entrepreneur is very different than being uh, a technician. Yeah, no. And I don't think you have to be an entrepreneur to be a champion in the construction industry. I mean, when you look at it, being an entrepreneur is it, it's not, it's for a very small percentage. There's a lot of people that do a lot of great things working for somebody else but then go out and think they can go do it by themselves. Cause like you said, there's a, a low barrier to entry. They get in, yeah. they want to go out, but they can have a bigger impact doing what they're doing and continuing to learn where they're at. And I think there is a, a big more in construction than anywhere yeah. where you have guys that would never be entrepreneurs going to be entrepreneurs because of what you just said is like, they don't know what that next step is. How do they go to the next level? It's just naturally, well, I start my own business. Yeah, it's a vicious cycle too. Because there's oftentimes there's not very robust, mature, or even uh, culturally healthy organizations for them to get plugged into, right? So now they're not really great entrepreneurs, but they're starting a new company and they're kind of creating the same thing. And they may themselves be amazing. They may hire some amazing people, but they're ultimately building an organization that they're not really meant to be the builders of. And so the people working for them want to realize their potential and they end up starting their own thing because they feel like that's the only option. Uh, and that's, a, that's like a cycle that you get into um, when it's an immature and highly fragmented industry. So how do we start unfragmenting it? How do we yeah. start bringing this to your yeah. other? Because I think that's where we start talking about what champions are, are doing in becoming that champion is we start creating that industry where it's not fragmented. It's not like, I think. Yeah, it's not, it's not a bad thing inherently, but markets tend to stray away from that over time. So if you think about what farming used to be, farming used to be much more of the wild west, <laughs> used to be a lot of family farms. Uh, and now farming is large machinery, largely driven by insurance companies. Uh, the family farm is, you know, it's dying. And if you have a century farm in Iowa, you're celebrated because there's not many left. Um, same thing with coffee shops, right? It doesn't mean that there aren't family farms. doesn't mean that there aren't small family coffee shops, but by and large, that industry is mostly unfragmented. Um, the financial services industry would be another one. Dentist offices would be another one. These are things that over time have become a lot more professionalized, a lot less fragmented. Um, now what causes that can be a number of things. Regulation is certainly an option. I have a proclivity against that. Uh, I think what ultimately drives change is consumer preference, right? I would say again, ultimately what's going to drive change is consumer preference. The way you can influence that. So what I, what I mean by that is if a client has the opportunity to pay for a high uh, priced option and a low priced option. And in their preference perception, they are the same options. They will choose a low price option. Now that if there are two different prices, but there are different value exchanges that they're perceiving, they may choose the high priced option, right? But if you want to be the catalyst for that change, what you need to do is provide real value with a professionalized home service. And when you do that, 
there is a chance that the consumer base demands it enough that it forces consolidation in the market to those who can actually perform those services in a professionalized way. Now, if the market, like I said, if the market doesn't value it, it will never happen. But my, my hunch is that there's much more demand for professionalized home services than there is supply. And I think the better we get at producing those services in mass, they'll continue, continue to be a market for it. And that's what will ultimately drive change. There's this other big factor called capital and capital is always seeking a return. And we all know what's going on with AI. And, and there is probably a rally too that, you know, that is more of a tide than a wave uh, that, you know, the trades are going to be kind of the last frontier of where capital can seek a real great return. But we, got, I mean, private equity's done a lot to come in and start bringing stuff to your other but i think what you're saying about the customer is mm -hmm. the key to this i come from i mean we were the price leader we understood what our value proposition was yeah and that matters and to stick to that and i think we get because you're always going to have the guys that are coming in that are they they're just going to do it cheaper than everybody else there's no but there's no value but it's educating or well, there is that's it's up to the client to decide that some clients prefer the cheapest price because they don't value what you offer as a professional service and that's okay right but by and large i don't think the market tends to lean that way and i didn't mean to cut you off i just get excited about oh. these things so apologize <laughs> no. for that in advance it's no, kind of like there's manny steakhouse and there's a market for manny steakhouse there's a very large market for the mcdonald's the arby's uh the KFCs, right? All the fast food places. <laughs> There's also a market for food trucks and there may even be a market for dumpster diving, right? Dumpster diving would be the lowest cost, right? And probably the lowest quality. Dumpster diving is never going away. It'll always be there. Some people, whether it's by means or preference, well, that's, that's probably a mean thing to say. It probably is by preference or by means, but there could be unlicensed food distributors on the street. So like whatever a step would be below a food truck, People would still choose to buy that. People still choose to buy Manny Steakhouse. It's ultimately up to consumer demand that's going to say, what does this industry tend to lean towards? And we have seen some private equity come more in the licensed trades, uh, especially with like electrical, HVAC, and plumbing. Again, I'm in painting, so I have a different kind of skew on this, which is painting is inherently different than some of those trades. Um, one, there's an emergency factor that's just not presence, present. So there's no paint emergencies. If you, you know, closest thing to a paint emergency is I have a party this Saturday, uh, but there are real consequences to emergencies with electrical, plumbing, and HVAC. Um, the other is the cost of rework, or like the pain of rework from a, from, a, from a consumer standpoint, right? So the worst case with rework and painting is you have to do it over again. You know, if you have to do rework and plumbing, electrical, HVAC, that's a big headache from a consumer side. So there's much more, those two elements tend to push the industry further into professionalization and consolidation and those licensed trades than they would in something like painting. You know, I know a lot of your, your listeners are more on the construction side, which does have a license to it. Yeah. It, and no problem. Like interrupt me as much as you want, man, because yeah. I love guys that are excited and having these sure. and want to have these conversations. Yeah. And I, I think like what you, a big key point to what you said is you have to be okay with it. Like when you decide what your value proposition is, where you're going to be at, you just have you have to be okay with that because this is where you start to figure out what customer is right for you and what customer is not. Mm -hmm. I never wanted to deal with the customer that wanted the cheapest possible solution because that just it wasn't a good fit. Mm -hmm. And some people do. I mean, Walmart likes to go the cheapest prices. Mm -hmm. Walmart, it's not a bad thing to be a Walton right now. I'll tell you, if you're, <laughs> share, if you're one of the major shareholders of Walmart, it's not too bad. Uh, but yeah, finding what you're kind of uniquely gifted at and leaning into that, you know, part of that is being, you know, the ethos of the business and the founder is typically that, you know, maybe senior level management. Um, even if you're a technician or on the, you know, on the employee side, what are you uniquely talented towards uh, or really passionate about? leaning into that. And that's where you're going to get, you know, the best bang for your buck, provide the most value. Yeah. And, I, and that's, I would hope the champions that have been listening, if this is your first time listening, think about what he just said, 
Because if you're out there running a business and you don't, you haven't quite figured that part of it out yet, you got to figure it out. You got to pay some attention about who you are and where you operate the best. It's so easy to complain too, right? So it's easy to say, nobody wants to pay my high prices when they can just get someone who's a low ball price. It's like, well, that is pretty telling. Right? I would choose the low price too, quite frankly, if there was no inherent you know, communicated value difference. And they're like, no one values what I bring to the table. Like, well, that's a market condition. You should probably change your business model. Mm. If that's true, right? Oftentimes there's, there's other issues of marketing, sales process, uh, just general messaging that come into play. But it is so easy to complain and say, nobody wants to, what I'm trying to give. Uh, or the other common complaint I've heard is, there's nobody that wants to work for less than X, Y dollars an hour. And uh, the people, I, I, I'm not a very kind soul to those people. Uh, I said, that is literally your job as a business owner is to find people who want to buy, procure the labor and put them together. There should be a Delta and that's called your profit. If you can't do those two things well, you should not own a company. You should not be running a business. That is like at its core, the most simplistic element of running a business is finding people who want to consume, finding people that can produce connecting them together, have some value add and exchange. And if you, if those two things are really uh, impossible, uh, <laughs> then do something else, right? It's, this is just not, this is not your calling in life. Um, now that's a harsh thing to say. I believe in coaching. I believe in support groups. I believe in, um, you know, cohorts and peer groups and all those good things, but I'm not a big fan of complaining. And it's, this is a very complaining industry by and large. You don't hear this much complaining uh, in dental offices or accountant offices. Uh, but in construction, there's a lot of complainers. Well, yeah. And I think that's one of the things that hoards us back as an industry, because I, I'm big on look, like we should just look in the mirror and understand that we're the nucleus for whatever's going on around us. And I love your, like, that is business in the most simplest sense. And if yeah. you can't do those two things, like it's not always a bad thing to work for somebody like especially if you can leverage their infrastructure right that's one of the most beautiful things in life is you plug in with a company and that you don't have to build but you can magnify your talents through their infrastructure that's phenomenal what ends up happening to most entrepreneurs you would call them is they get into an organization that they have built that is now a reducer on their unique talents I was looking for the word there. It's a reducer. So they may be very talented at these couple of things, but they got to run this business to be able to do that. And the business isn't going to scale because it's hard and they're not realizing their potential in this unique gift that they have. Or you can step into another company and that company is now magnifying this ability because everything else is taken care of. You have a unique talent. Um, again, I love entrepreneurs. I'm an entrepreneur. I love working with entrepreneurs. Uh, I'm not trying to tell someone they're not an entrepreneur, but it is many, many, many more few people than think that they are right now. I think it's been glamorized a little bit. Um, it's a hustle economy. It's a tough economy. It's a boom economy. Nobody knows, but um, it, it's it's a unique thing that you should really have some introspection around of, uh, am I called to be an entrepreneur? Because it really is a sickness. And uh, if you're not, it's going to be pretty traumatizing and pretty, uh, you ultimately, most of the time people end up becoming martyrs when they put themselves in that situation. If it's not their true calling. I love it. You use very, very, just some of the best terminologies that I have heard. We're 130 episodes into this, but just very, just plain, concise. And you, know, you can tell, you know, your stuff like it, it's, it's, it, you can definitely well, tell that. Yeah. I know my beliefs and there, I, it's hard for me to say, I know things, right. I try and think about things a little bit and be clear in what you believe. Um, but I'm open. I'm, I'm wrong more oftentimes than not. I'm open to be proven wrong. As I said, when we started this thing, you never step into the same river twice. So maybe I'll sing a different tune a few years from now, but hopefully this strikes a tune with a couple people. And if it's said in a succinct way or a way it's easy and consumed, or um, it's not just surface level talk uh, where people are saying platitudes, like you gotta, you gotta plan your work and work your plan. Uh, <laughs> people are like, what is he even saying? Uh, hopefully I'm providing some sus sustenance that people are actually thinking through some of these concepts and doing some self-reflection. I 100% I 
I mean, I, th I think you're definitely hitting the nail on the head. And I guess I, uh, one question I have, so it's like, you're in a big, you're in a big market. You're in other markets, yeah. I would assume by, with your yeah. uh, venture stuff that you're doing is what are you seeing in the market right now throughout yeah. the United States? What, what's your, what's your feel? What's your thumb on that with what you think is going to be happening here? 2024 into 2025. So I'll say, you know, broad scale, good indicators, Q1, 2024. Um, uh, you know, everyone had some hesitation, you know, Q4 of the last year. And I think we've all been pleasantly surprised at, um, you know, how resilient this market has been. The fed just announced, I think this week, if not yesterday, that they are, um, kind of slow stepping a drop in interest rates, um, which hasn't blown things up. And it's actually pretty encouraging for someone like me to sit back and say, wow, this is great. The fed has a lot of tools still, if things start to slow down, so that's some kind of, that's a little bit of gas they can pour on the fire. But all that to be said, I stand by what I said, started hammering on in about probably 2017, which is your only competition is your ability to execute your business model. And that is as true today as it was in, when I said it back then. And especially if you're in the trades, uh, this is not a very saturated industry of high professional business talent. <laughs> this is very fragmented. The bar is very low. You are only limited by your ability to execute your business model. That will determine your level of success. That will determine your level of scale. The economy could cut in half and you still would not be limited by a market cap hmm. <laughs> because the amount of performance that's out, just the level of performance that's out there by and large, it's just, you should be outperforming that. It's a pretty sad state. And I just call a spade a spade there. Um, so that's my, that's my, you know, my general tone. So we're off to a strong Q1. We have a lot of tools and toolkit to stay resilient. It looks like this year, macro scale, you've got the boomers retiring, millennials haven't gotten in, simple supply and demand, you know, the millennials that are buying houses are not do-it-yourselfers, right? So simple su supply and demand, you've got a great access point there. Then you've got the, but you've got the macro scale, the macro, macro, macro items of what's happening with AI. Is there a five to 10 year outlook on the white collar jobs? What does that flux into the blue collar jobs look like? If you can get well positioned now, it's a great place to be. For the short term, it looks great. For the medium term, it looks great. Long term, you got to be competitive. And if you're not getting sharp, if you're not skilling up, if you're not getting professional, you will get destroyed. <laughs> You'll just get wiped <laughs> out. And uh, rightfully so, because we want this industry professionalized. Consumers demand better. Uh, we have stereotypes that are pretty bad. Uh, and stereotypes are there for a reason. And that doesn't last forever. Mic drop, man. I mean, this is why we do Construction Champions podcast is because what you're talking about happening to be successful in the long term is what the is what everybody needs to do. Like that yeah. is where we need to take the industry. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah, there's a lot of profit. You call it like there's a surplus of profit for the, the level of business professionalism that's in this industry. Mm -hmm. And with that, as AI starts to, you know, leverage out white collar jobs, these profits should be competed away or competed more competitively. And I think we've all met the guy that we lost the bid to, or maybe you were that person 10 years ago and you're like, shoot, that was not like an A plus experience for that client. And uh, that is the stereotype of our industry yet. It can be very, very profitable. <laughs> and you would say, it's only a matter of time to pop top until top business talent and capital uh, looks to exploit that, right? And compete those profits away. And that is, again, it's the right thing for the industry. It's what ultimately drives demand uh, or drives professionalism. It's not, in my opinion, regulation that drives that. It's consumer preference. Once they get a taste of what professionalized services look like, that's something we try to do at Paris Painting is set an unrealistic expectation standard that anybody else is going to have a hard time meeting. So now you've got a problem client because they expect what Paris painting delivers. It's very hard to replicate unless you have a professionalized company at scale. Right, so now the consumers start to demand that. And then you have more of the tide, less than a wave of just business talent and capital looking to seek returns. Awesome, man. I love it. I love what you're talking about. And uh, thank you for taking the time to be on the show today. Absolutely, man. This was fun. Appreciate you reaching out. So for all the construction champions out there, if they wanted to connect with you, learn more about what you do, follow you, where's the best places for them to do that? 
Yeah. I'm a millennial, so I'm pretty active on social media. So if you go to Facebook or Instagram, I'm Jason Paris. Um, I live in Minnesota. You can probably find me there. Uh, if you email me, you can do Jason at uh, olaf-management.com. And that's going to be spelled out A-L-E-P-H hyphen M-G-M-T dot com. Um, so if you figure out how to spell that and write it, it's a good hurdle for people. And if you want to call me, I'll never answer your call because I'm a millennial. You can only text me, but I'm not going to give you my number. You have to earn it. So good luck there. I will put I will put that in the show notes to help <laughs> some enough. people out there. Uh, but yeah, once again, thank you for taking the time to be in on the show today. It's been fantastic. And I love your knowledge. I love what you spit. Yeah. Man. Good job, man. It was good energy. I appreciate it. This was an enjoyable one. Awesome. All right, construction champions, another episode in the bag. And you know what? I Jason, he just talks about what being a construction champion is in every essence. When he talks about the future of the industry, where we're headed, what it should look like. It's that it's why I made the show. It's to go. So guys had access to that. So they start to understand is that as an industry, we have to just rise. We have to do better for our customers to change the mindset. Because if we don't do that, the mindset of the customers never changes. And then the mindset and how the construction industry is looked upon never changes. And we just stay in this state where we let the bad eggs dictate our entire reputation in everything that we do. And I don't believe that's how it should be. I've shared that on here multiple times. We need to start to just come to other and raise the bar. I think a good look in the mirror moment is, hey, I'm all we're, we're all about entrepreneurship here, but it's not necessarily for everybody. And in the construction industry, I think we feel that harder than any other realm because you can go out and get a construction business, be up and going if you're good at what you're doing. But a lot of times we just buy ourselves a job when you could be a really good resource to somebody. And you can probably make more money going and working for somebody else and de deliver a better customer experience because you're happier and you're doing what you love to do. So I think that's a good thing to look at for everybody out there listening today is maybe just take a, take a moment and be like, am I cut out to do this? Am I delivering an experience to my customers that moves the industry forward because I'm meant to be an entrepreneur, because I'm meant to be a construction business owner, or am I failing that and actually doing more harm to myself in the industry as a whole? So construction champions, ask yourself that question. Make sure you go check out all of our sponsors. Check out the show notes for Jason's contact information. And until next time, be the champion you're meant to be. Introducing Buildercoms, the construction communication software that's changing the game. Say goodbye to communication challenges and hello to effortless communication. With Buildercoms, you can communicate with clients, share pictures, videos, and documents, and keep clients informed about the progress of their projects. Get real-time updates, prevent miscommunications and delays, and ensure successful projects. Don't let bad communication ruin your construction projects. Try Buildercoms today. Visit us at Buildercoms.com.